Officially known as the Commonwealth of Kentucky, Kentucky is one of four U.S. states constituted as a Commonwealth, the others being Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts. Originally a part of Virginia, Kentucky became the 15th state to join the Union in 1792. Kentucky is known as the Bluegrass State, a nickname based on the bluegrass found in many of its pastures. It is a land with diverse environments and abundant natural resources, including the world's longest cave system, the Mammoth Cave National Park. It is the greatest length of navigable waterways and streams in the United States, and the two largest man-made lakes east of the Mississippi River. Kentucky is also home to large deer and turkey populations, and the largest free-ranging elk herd east of the Mississippi River. Kentucky is also known for horse racing, bourbon, corvettes, tobacco, bluegrass music, basketball, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and the nation's most productive coal fields. This part of Kentucky is known as the Eastern Coal Fields, or primarily as East Kentucky. It is part of the Central Appalachian Bituminous Coal Field, which includes all or parts of 30 Kentucky counties and adjoining areas in Ohio, West Virginia, Virginia, and Tennessee. It covers an area from the Allegheny Mountains in the east across the Cumberland Plateau to the Pottsville Escarpment in the west. The Daniel Boone National Forest is located here on the rough, beautiful terrain east of the Pottsville Escarpment. The forest is filled with many natural arches and sandstone cliffs along the Red River Gorge, making it a favorite destination among rock climbers worldwide. During the Civil War, most of this region leaned toward the Union due to its makeup of mostly small farmers at the time. But more than 2,000 men from this area formed the 5th Kentucky Voluntary Infantry, known as the Army of East Kentucky under General Humphrey Marshall, CSA. During the Great Depression, the New Deal programs and the Organization of the United Mine Workers of America made many of the eastern counties Democratic. President Lyndon Johnson came to the isolated hills of Martin County, Kentucky in 1964. Standing on the porch of Tom Fletcher's cabin in the little eastern Kentucky town of Inez, he declared the war on poverty. Fifty years later, eastern Kentucky is still primarily known for two things. Coal mining and poverty. Indeed, if you pick up a Kentucky history book, very few things have ever happened in East Kentucky. Let's see. There's Jonathan Swift's silver mine, wherever that is. Then, of course, there is the Cumberland Gap, the Hatfield and McCoy feud, and, of course, Daniel Boone. Oddly enough, the history books are mostly silent about the early pioneers in the area, the 22 Civil War battlefields, and the Herculean effort to bring industry to the area. The Kentucky tourism and vacation planners are just as silent about East Kentucky. Yet many parks, lakes, wildlife preserves, and museums crisscross the area. East Kentucky has a rich, rich culture and musical history with a number of nationally known and acclaimed country music singers and musicians hailing from the area, including Loretta Lynn, Crystal Gale, The Judds, Ricky Skaggs, Dwight Yoakam, and Tom T. Hall, just to name a few. Each year, there are a multitude of festivals and celebrations across the area highlighting the work of local musicians, photographers, artists, and craftsmen who work to keep our heritage alive while building a future for the people of the mountains. But the biggest injustice of all has to do with these two areas of the state known as the Big Sandy and the Kentucky River areas. These two areas at one time were known as, quote, the energy capital of the world, unquote. However, if it hadn't been for this county, that may have never occurred. This is Letcher County, Kentucky. The topography of the county is somewhat unique. The entire southeastern border is made up of the 126-mile-long Cumberland or Pine Mountain, the lowest gap on the mountain is in the northeast corner. This gap, now known as Pound Gap, was originally called the Sounding Gap. However, to the locals of the area, it was known as, quote, Old Cumberland Gap, unquote, in the late 1800s. At the foot of the mountain, near present-day Jenkins, Kentucky, there is a natural divide. 
The water on the north side of this divide flows into the Big Sandy River and onto the Ohio. On the south side is the head of the Kentucky River. Although settlers have been coming to the area since the late 1700s, other than a few scattered farms and one or two small settlements, Letcher County had a very small population in the early 1900s. However, thanks to one man with a dream, all that would change in less than a 10-year period. The coal companies he did business with would build the cities we know today as Jenkins, MacRoberts, Birdide, Dunham, Fleming, Chip, later known as Neon, Heyman, now known as Haymond, and Hemphill, and others across East Kentucky. Sadly, he would never live to see the outcome of his vision for the people of East Kentucky. However, none of these towns may have ever been built, and the dream never come to fruition, had it not been for a man standing in a creek. The mining history of East Kentucky, and in particular Letcher County, begins quite simply with a man standing in a creek during the Civil War. Union Army Captain Richard Brose from New York stumbled upon some coal while crossing the Elkhorn Creek in Pike County. A prospector by training, Brose knew these washed up coal samples originated in a king coal vein that had to be the best coal in the United States. Wait a minute, that's not right. <laughs> History is like a puzzle found in your grandmother's attic. It's often smelly, dusty, and the pieces are scattered all over the floor as the pretty box it came in has long since disappeared. With great time and effort, we can connect the pieces and discover the picture, even if there are a few missing pieces. Because we're unable to truly experience the past, our historical interest relies on a variety of scattered interviews, stories, and incomplete statistical data. It's sort of like listening to someone tell you a story about someone else telling a story told by someone else. There is no absolute truth waiting to be uncovered. And to make matters worse, the stories are hindered by hindsight. That is to say, the stories are filled with opinion and interjection based on what the teller knows at the time of the telling, rather than the events as they actually happened. To discover the history of an event or a place, one must combine all the available stories and focus on available factual evidence from the time and to make every effort to be as accurate as possible. This effort, while time-consuming, is very rewarding to those willing to make the sacrifice. The story about Captain Richard Brose standing in a creek during the Civil War can only be found in one place. The History of Elkhorn Coal by Jeanette Knowles Before it was penned in 1990, there is no history of that event ever happening, so it is perhaps romanticizing what actually did happen. What we do know about Richard Brose can be found in the book The History of the Consolidation Coal Company, 1864 to 1934, by Charles E. Binchley. However, the history of coal in Letcher County goes further back. Starting on page 54 of Consol's book, we learn of the expansion into East Kentucky. Quote, Continuing its policy of expansion, consolidation entered the East Kentucky field in 1909 with the purchase of approximately 30,000 acres of coal and surface land in Johnson, Martin, and Lawrence counties and the construction of the Miller's Creek Railroad. The next year, the company added approximately 100,000 acres of Elkhorn coal lands in Knott, Letcher, and Pike counties and constructed the Sandy Valley and Elkhorn Railroad. Thus, Miller's Creek Block and Elkhorn Coking Coals were added to the company's line of fuels." Unquote. The book goes on to tell us that it had been known for years that coal was in abundance along the Big Sandy Valley of Kentucky. 
In 1845, mining operations had been opened along its banks to supply river steamboats with coal. However, in 1847, development of the Miller's Creek Block Coal began at Van Leer with a man named George Carlisle and other capitalists from Cincinnati with the formation of the Peach Orchard Coal Company, which was located approximately 25 miles north of Van Leer, Kentucky. They had hired a man named William B. Mellon, who had wide experience and exceptional ability to develop the field. Mellon constructed houses, store buildings, churches, a schoolhouse, sawmill, gristmill, and a carding plant. By 1850, there was a fair-sized town around the operation that was later named Mellonsburg in, or in honor of Mr. Mellon. Mellon remained with the company till the outbreak of the Civil War, when he and several others from Mellonsburg joined the Army and never returned. After the Civil War, the mining was resumed at Peach Orchard, and the coal mine in the area was placed on barges and sent downriver to Cincinnati up until 1881. At that time, John Carlisle, the son of George Carlisle, seeing the potential of the area, built the Chatteroy Railroad from Ashland, Kentucky to Peach Orchard, and rail shipments were commenced. In 1887, that railroad was extended up the river to White House. It is about this time that a school teacher in Johnson County first realized the great possibilities in the coal business. Over the next 20 years, John C. C. Mayo, school teacher went about buying mineral properties and endeavoring to induce capital to enter the East Kentucky coal fields, certain that with the coming railroad, great fortunes were to be made along with economic prosperity and development for the people of the mountains. In 1861, permits were issued by the state of Kentucky for a coal survey that would start at what is now Pound Gap and run along the Elkhorn Creek to its mouth near Elkhorn City, Kentucky. Due to the Civil War, the survey never took place. Twenty years later, in 1881, a new survey began near Elkhorn City and moved upstream to Ash Camp, Kentucky. Once there, they declared that due to the nearness of the Cumberland Fault, the seam of coal was unminable and the survey was abandoned. Enter Richard Brose. Civil War veteran Captain Richard Brose of New York was not a geologist. He was an engineer by vocation. However, he became involved with the search for minerals beginning with the early oil development in Pennsylvania around Oil City. Following an unsuccessful venture to find gold and silver in the Sierras, Bros came to the lower reaches of the Big Sandy River in 1881. In the interest of Horace Walbridge, a prominent merchant and railroad man of Toledo, he started his search near Louisa. Not liking what he found, he moved up the river near the peach orchard seam. What he found was promising, however, he decided to search further to the south where he uncovered the Miller's Creek seam. After reporting his findings on the Walbridge project and purchasing 10,000 acres for his principals near Van Leer, Bros continued to survey and explore along the Big Sandy. In 1883, he heard about the report done along the Elkhorn Creek and decided to go to Ash Camp to survey it for himself. Upon arrival, he found that indeed some of the best coking coal was indeed in the Cumberland Fault. In September of that year, Bros pushed further up the Elkhorn Creek, and on its headwaters, near the mouth of Joe's Branch, he found the coking coal he had long sought. Bros opened the coal in countless places for miles around the area, searching for the scope of its boundary limits, and in 1887 he was authorized by his backers to purchase all the coal that he could re recommend. Bros selected with exacting care and purchased a large acreage on the headwaters of the Elkhorn Creek and along the adjacent watersheds found by him to embrace the, quote, cream of the Elkhorn coal, unquote. The achievement of Bros only became apparent years later when it was found that the chemical makeup of the coal he purchased changed so drastically within a few miles of the Jenkins area that it required a shipment to a different market. Ironically, Richard Bros' backer Horace Walbridge died in January 1893 and Bros was never able to get the railroad to penetrate so far into so motor region as to assure development of this choice property. 
Bros eventually sold all of his holdings to John C. C. Mayo for a mere sum of $30,000. John C. C. Mayo had a dream of bringing economic development and the pleasures of the 20th century to the mountains. For 30 years, he and other local individuals endeavored to make this dream come true. This list of people included John Buckingham, James W. Turner, George Copeland, and Dan Davis of Paintsville, B.F. Combs and the Harkins family of Prestonsburg, John F. Hager of Ashland, W.F. Height of Huntington, and C.B. Slimp of Big Stone Gap, Virginia. Judge John Hager had been with the prospecting party of Richard Brose in 1883 and understood firsthand the wealth that they were just starting to uncover and the opportunities it could bring. Together, they had formed numerous mining and landholding companies in Kentucky and West Virginia. Since the late 1800s, the Consolidation Coal Company had been buying existing coal fields and updating the miners' housing and amenities associated with each mining operation. In 1903, Consol had bought the Fairmont District of the Monongahela Valley in West Virginia, ran by Senator Clarence W. Watson, and elected Watson as the president of Consolidation Coal Company. On December 6, 1907, at approximately 10 a.m., an explosion rocked the little town of Monongahela, West Virginia, five miles from Fairmont. There was an explosion in two mines. The Monaga number six and the Monaga number eight. Every man within both mines were killed save one. A total of 359 men. 250 widows and a thousand children were left without support, creating a great and immediate necessity for substantial aid. The Fairmont Company and Consol quickly organized relief parties and sent supplies to the stricken families from their stores close by. And various organizations come into being for the relief of the widows and the children under the name Monaga Mines Relief Committee. And simultaneously, on December the 27th, an appeal from the committee was published in more than 2,000 newspapers throughout the country. The sum of $154,360 was immediately raised. Among the contributors was the Carnegie Hero Fund Commission. John Mayo had been inquiring into the affairs of the Consolidation Coal Company for a few years. Impressed by the living conditions and the amenities maintained by the company for its employees and the reaction of the company to the recent Monaga tragedy, Mayo sent envoys to Senator Watson as to the purchase of the holdings of his Northern Coal and Coke Company and soon negotiations had begun as to the purchase of 30,000 acres of land in what is now known as the Miller's Creek Division and an additional purchase in the Elkhorn Division after a survey had been performed. In May of 1909, construction of the Miller's Creek Railroad connecting the mines with the C&O Railroad, a distance of about four miles, was well underway. At the same time, armed with the survey reports from the Elkhorn Division, negotiations with the Lexington and Eastern Railroad now known as the L&N, began to extend the railroad from Wolf County to Wright's Fork on the Kentucky River, where the coal seam averaged 14 to 19 feet thick, and planning began for 14 mines and eight modern cities in Letcher County. The following is a direct quote from Consolidation Coal Company's book. Quote, On October the 8th, 1910, Consolidation obtained an option from the Northern Coal and Coke Company for the purchase of 100,000 acres of this pier of all Kentucky coals. This property was conveyed by the Northern Coal and Coke Company to the Consolidation Coal Company by 12 deeds, six of which were dated November the 28th, 1910, and six January the 2nd, 1911. The area had been examined by engineers of the Consolidation Company as well as prominent mining experts and geologists, representing capitalists of the United States, Canada, and England. And it was their unanimous opinion that it was the most valuable area of undeveloped coal land in America. One of the most prominent of the engineers stated that the field would contain, in its several seams, at least 12,000 tons per acre, 
a prophecy which became more significant when it was realized that all of the coal would come from mines which were practically self-draining. That fully 500 million tons of the highest grade of coal could be mined from one seam alone. That for coking and byproduct use, the coal was unsurpassed by any known at the time. Subsequent prospecting by diamond drill and crop openings demonstrate that one other seam, a split of the Elkhorn, would produce coal of similar character and quality, increasing the quantity of mineable coal to a total of 900 million or possibly 1 billion tons. In 1911, the Consolidation Coal Company, also known as Consol, purchased 100,000 acres of land in Pike, Letcher, and Knott Counties from John Mayo's Northern Coal and Coke Company. Plans were made for the extension of three railroads. The L&E, later known as the l n would be expanded from Wolf County to a point on the North Fork of the Kentucky River called Wright's Fork. A new railroad, called the Sandy Valley and Elkhorn, or SV&E, would be built by Consol from Shelby Valley to the head of the Elkhorn Creek. The l n and the SV&E would take over a year to complete, and construction needed to start right away. So a third railroad, the Interstate Railroad, would be extended from Glamorgan, Virginia, to a spot now known as Almira, Virginia, a distance of eight miles. Consol would bring the equipment for nine sawmills, two brick plants, two locomotives, the rail, and cars needed for two narrow gauge construction trains, along with 12 boilers and generators for a power plant to Almira, Virginia. Construction crews were brought in to build two mountain roads, 14 mines, and the houses and businesses needed to attract and house the labor force for the construction and to work in the mines. The road crews would widen the road across Pound Mountain and at the same time construct a new road from the town now known as Dunham to Mac Roberts. All of the equipment would be drug across Pound Mountain using sleds and teams of oxen. By far, at 16 tons apiece, the boilers and generators were the heaviest items and needed teams of up to 20 head of oxen to complete this Herculean effort. Consol would then drag the equipment needed for one of the construction trains, a brick plant, and five sawmills across the new road to Wright's Fork. Although Consol would eventually construct 14 mines and 8 modern cities in Letcher County, efforts were focused on the sites now known as Jenkins and Mac Roberts. Jenkins was strategically chosen for the nearness of two of the railroads. Wright's Fork, or Mac Roberts, was chosen because of the Elkhorn No. 3 coal seam averaged 12 to 14 feet thick at this location. As part of the deal made with Mayo, Consol would spend $40 million on the miners' living conditions and amenities before shipping the first block of coal. These eight cities would be the envy of the nation. They would have recreation centers, company stores, meat markets, hotels, bakeries, dairy and poultry farms, movie theaters, minor league baseball teams, golf courses, swimming pools, newly designed housing and would have electricity and running water long before some of the major cities of today. The construction of these cities would take 10 years and would be the single largest construction effort in the history of the state of Kentucky. Sadly, less than three years after the construction began, John C. C. Mayo would die on May 11, 1914 and never see the fruition of his 30-year effort to bring economic development and the pleasures of the 20th century to the mountains. Because of the changing political and social economical conditions in the years following his death, John C. C. Mayo's true influence on the coal companies would be hidden for years by the mask of corporate intrigue. 
In 2010, I decided to devote some web pages to the history of the mining towns that I grew up in. I had the knowledge that had been told to me by my parents, my grandparents, and neighbors as a roadmap to go by. But in seeking out the series of events to piece them all together, I discovered that a great deal of them were wrong, incomplete, and contradictory. An easy one to point out is the history of Fleming, Kentucky. Elkhorn Cole founded Fleming in 1913, but the evidence is contradictory. Elkhorn Coal was founded in 1915 from a merger of three companies, Elkhorn Fuel, Elkhorn Mining, and Mineral Fuels Company. These three companies came into existence in February of 1913 because Consolidation Coal Company wanted to buy more land from Mayo but could not get the funding because of the construction effort taking place in Letcher County. The chairman of Consol, Senator Watson, and his nephew, Vice President of Consol, George Fleming, and their backers spun off a new company made up entirely of Consol officers and employees. In March of that year, Elkhorn Fuel, quote, purchased land, unquote, and started mining in April under the name Elkhorn Mining. Yet by November, over 200 houses and all the buildings were finished and in operation, and a, and a menu on the clubhouse dated November 1913 celebrates the first Thanksgiving of Elkhorn Coal in Fleming. Another item of interest is Seco, Kentucky. We are told that Seco was founded in 1915 by the Southeast Coal Company. However, 1915 was the incorporation date of Southeast and the installation of a first class post office at Seco. Legal documents at the Letcher County Courthouse states that the coal rights were sold in 1898. Oral histories refer to the river being turned, the office building finished, and three sawmills operating from 1905 to 1910. Only the church was built after 1912 by the people with materials supplied by Southeast Coal on land donated by the company. In his book, written in 1918, Fess Whitaker states that Southeast was, quote, working the old Wright brother's mind, unquote. When we look at the various coal operations in the area and the men behind them, we find an interesting pattern. Consol, Elkhorn, and Southeast Coal all had dealings with John Mayo and his company, the Northern Coal and Coke. As part of the deal that Mayo made with all these companies, placed him on the board of directors and made him a major stockholder. We also find that Mayo and his associates have been gathering mineral rights and mining coal in the area for over 30 years prior to the first deal he made with Consol. It is very possible that Mayo moved these companies around like chess pieces in order to speed up development of the area. We may never know as the records from that era are scattered, incomplete, and not very factual. However, what is clear is that Mayo knew the value of the coal properties he was in possession of, and the fact that he was able to make deals with Consol and their subsidiary companies unlike any other made before or since truly makes John Caldwell Calhoun Mayo King Cole.